So if we were playing Xbox, it would pop up right now with achievement unlocked, entire book of the Bible read in one sitting. So well done, you all. I'd like to look a little bit at what is going on in Luke. And we're going to look a little bit about what's going on in Paul and Philemon. And then we're going to say, what do these have to do with us? Right? So first of all, this is not even this spring the first time. We were a couple chapters ago receiving this same kind of word from Jesus in Luke. This whole, um, I'm going to spoiler alert it, hyperbolic, hate your father and your mother, your brother, your wife, your children, pretty much everything because your life itself covers all of it, right? Pick up your cross if you want to follow me. Um, Sometimes we're feeling a little dramatic, and sometimes so is Jesus. but I, but I think that texts like these, and, and again, hear me, this doesn't come up once in Jesus' ministry. This is a common theme of Jesus' ministry. I think if we were to say, okay, Jesus woke up, had a bad day, said this thing, and disregard it, we'd be missing the fact that this is a repetitive theme, right? In Mark's gospel, Jesus' mother and brother and sister Mark's gospel actually never mentions Jesus' father. There is no Joseph in Mark's gospel. Come to him while he's teaching in a house, and it says that Jesus responds that the only people who are his mother, brother, and sisters are those who do the will of God. There's this strong almost rebuke of his family of origin as he embraces what it means to have a family in God. In, in Luke, we don't only get this passage. If we were to go back to Luke 9, again in Luke 12, and then in Luke 14, we get three different sections of a rejection of what was. Do you remember? Uh, it was probably six months ago, so no. Um, when we were talking about the, uh, the calls to discipleship in Luke 9, and Jesus saying, let the dead bury their own, when the would-be disciple wants to go bury his father first. Um, the, the allusion to Elijah, when it says, anyone who puts hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. There's this continual theme going on And I don't know that we need to take it at face value. Jesus is an observant Jew. He honors his father and mother. We see enough of a intimate, beloved relationship between Jesus and other parts, between his family members and his close associates. But there is a strong message that Jesus wants us to understand that the call to Christian discipleship does involve a willingness to self-differentiate ourselves from the systems that we were born into and walk into a new day. And that's not always easy. So a few, uh, I have to make sure they're not here. I mean, if they were here, I would just call them out. A few weeks ago, I did a wedding um, for, it turns out, my neighbors. And um, and one of the, the, the grooms, last name is Bat, and they are farmers for over 100 years out in Wilder. And, and when we get to the wedding, he's like, well, this is the bats. They are all on one side of the river, and I forget what the other family was. They are all farming on that side of the river. And um, I ran into Lindy High, and Lindy had worked with Phil Bat, who was our governor, and I said, I discovered, I didn't make the connection, that they're actually related. And Lindy said, they're all related, <laughs> right? So if you're in Wilder, you're, you're of, I asked if they feud. They don't. They like each other. But you're either in this family tree or you're in that family tree, right? I think this is important to remember because this is very much how Judaism in its agricultural economy understood itself. You didn't move. You didn't leave. 
You took the, the livelihood of your family. You stayed on the land you were given. So when we hear God say to Abraham, pick up and leave where you are and go to the land that I will show you, we think that's like going to college, right? And it's a natural progression of our lives. But for Abraham, that's a unrooting of the world he has known and been birthed into that is tantamount to a rejection of his family. Pick up and leave the land that has been good enough for all your forefathers because I will show you a new land. When we encounter Peter and the greatest of the disciples, Andrew, <laughs> and then James and John, they're fishing with their father. And this is one of those pieces of the text I always never want us to, to get behind. Because when Jesus says to James and John, drop your nets and follow me, they leave dad in the boat. And they start off following Jesus. And I'm imagining dad's like, how am I getting home? And who's hauling in the fish? There is an element of our scripture that wants us to wrestle with the fact that God envisions a kingdom of God, which we always hear as good news, and it is. But it's of a different order. It's of a different social order. And it requires leaving what we've known. And sometimes it does that in hard and even harsh ways. And if you want to know what I mean by that, you can ask my parents what it is like for their son to leave home and take a call on a church five states away. And ask them if there isn't a sense of leaving behind your family because you have family. We're going to set that here for a minute, and we're going to come over here to Paul. I love, by the way, to preach a day in which Jesus is hard to handle and Paul is gentle. It's just kind of fun that way, right? Although, as we dig into Philemon, I'd like to question just how gentle Paul is being. First of all, we're not entirely sure, but the best guess is that Paul is in Rome right now. He has three long imprisonments, Ephesus, uh, Colossians, or Corinthians, and, um, and then he is in Rome. The old man reference, the sense of passage in the geography as he seems to be talking about it, the fact that a letter is taken to Ephesus means he probably isn't in Ephesus now. We think he's in Rome. So this is somewhere near Paul's death. Um, for those who, who enjoy it but don't know it, Paul's arrested in like 61, he's in jail, gets out somewhere around 62, and then we never really hear from him again, but we believe he stays in Rome and dies there, um, martyred somewhere around 64. So Paul's in Rome, and it seems to be the case that while he was in Rome, Onesimus, who was a slave of Philemon, has escaped potentially did something wrong, some theft, but he fled. So Rome is a slave-owning state. There were bounties on escaped slaves. Um, so it would make sense that Onesimus needs to go a long ways to get away from where he would not be known. And Rome, while the center of power, also as a large city, had a large population of escaped slaves who were a fertile ground for Christian converts because Christianity has a complicated but transforming relationship to slavery. We're talking about what it means to be free in Christ. And it's important also to understand another language that Jesus, that Paul wants to understand. Paul calls himself a prisoner for the gospel later in the text. But the first time he says he's a prisoner, who's he a prisoner of? in this text. He's a prisoner of Christ, right? So for, for Paul, 
the, the claim Jesus makes on his life, he has become a slave in many ways to that, right? Leaving behind any sense of his former contracts, his former relationship to the law, his former relationship to the faith, he now understands himself to have an obligation to Jesus. It's claimed my life. And that means something. So when Onesimus comes to prison, they meet, presumably, they, he speaks the gospel story to him. Onesimus converts to Christianity. Paul is saying now, this means your life has changed. Your relationships change. Your place in the social order as God sees it is changed. And then advocating... He's actually um, here, and we have to name this, a presbyter, an advocate on behalf of Onesimus, Onesimus when he writes to Philemon and says, so here's the thing, buddy. Your slave is now a Christian, and that means everything is different. Now, Paul's a little slippery about how different if you were to get into Pauline texts, there are seven unequivocal, unequivocally agreed upon authentic Paul texts, and this is one of them. Paul comes down differently on slavery in almost all of them. In Corinthians, he says, slaves, be good to your masters. Elsewhere, he's going to tell masters to be good to their slaves. This is the closest he comes along with Galatians to saying that once you're a Christian, a Christian can't own another Christian, right? And you have that ambivalent comment in your text in front of you that says he is now no longer a slave, but more than a slave, he's your brother, right? Now that doesn't say I'm rebuking the Roman practice of slavery. He didn't command Philemon to free Onesimus, he just said, your obligations, you as a servant or slave of Christ, to Onesimus have changed forever. And whatever was can no longer be. And what will be has to look like what would be done by the one who bears the name of Christ, one who has picked up the cross and followed in discipleship to the Lord of life. Which is why if you look in this letter, there's so many tender pieces of it. Where we might normally expect Paul to say, you know, hey Tom, I love seeing your faith and your love. That's not what he says. He says, I love seeing your love and your faith. And in all of this, what Paul wants to seem to say is that when we get into this Christian relationship, when we take on the name of Christ, when we lift up our cross and follow in the way that God has deemed it to become, the ultimate law of our life becomes love. And Paul, in his complicated post-pharisaical Roman citizen, I'm turning over apple carts, but I'm only taking on what I can actually succeed in kind of way, doesn't actually say, you might still be a slave, and you still have some place in the ordering of the society, and there's things I can't change about Rome, but in how you inhabit those relationships... You can never be nothing but loving first, middle, and last. And if you're not a la Jesus, then you aren't really a disciple of Christ. You are not a servant of the gospel we experienced in Jesus Christ. So here's the part I love about Paul. So if you read... All the so-called experts about Philemon, they'll say, this is Paul at his most gracious self. He doesn't take on authority. He doesn't force anything. But um, I guess they just had more functional households than mine. And they're not used to messages like, hey, I trust that you can do this. But by the way, would you also pencil in that I'm coming to visit soon? 
you know, because I'm going to check. And, and some of the undertones, and I think Paul's actually having a dilemma here. I think Paul doesn't want to command anyone to do anything. Right? This is, the, this is the dilemma of a parent, of a child learning to self-differentiate themselves from the authority structures and make value-driven decisions on their own because now they're not doing it out of fear of an authority structure but because they intuit the good of it. Right? And Paul wants to encourage that kind of maturity in his communities. But Paul also knows they have to do it. Right? Isn't that the great challenge of later parenting, right? I see the mistakes my child's about to make, and I need to let them make that mistake, but only so many of them, <laughs> and only certain ones. And Paul's living that dilemma. So he wants to say to Philemon, it's really important that you get this. You can never treat him the same again. You are brothers in Christ and that must be the ultimate relationship you have, whatever servant-master relationship you used to have. That's so important to Paul that it's fighting with his value of, but I need you, I need to respect your maturity, and I need you to make that choice for yourself. So Paul puts before him this opportunity. Here's this letter in which I framed my own complicated relationship to tell you that the moment you named yourself Christian and the moment you walked into this commitment to be the ecclesia together, the world changed. The social order changed. Jesus ends the text where we read today by saying, almost unrelatedly, who starts to build a tower and doesn't count the cost? Here we could say, who goes to put a roof on a building without counting the cost? Right? It seems like this really practical decision. It seems like the kind of thing, like Warren wanted to go to Comic-Con in Seattle, so, so I said, make a budget. I want to see, an, <laughs> we're an accounting family, I want to see an Excel spreadsheet that tells me the hotel costs, the gas costs, the expected food costs, and I want you to come up with a budget, and then I want to see the receipts when you come home, and I'll contribute to it, but this is about you getting to look at what's the difference between making a budget and then living in that budget, and how easily we go over that budget, right? It's counting the cost. Yes, you can go to Seattle, the Comic-Con. I'll even help you do that. But I need you to weigh what it cost. And Jesus is trying to look out at this crowd of folk who say, oh, I really like what Jesus is about. And he says, yeah, but there's a cost to what I'm about. Paul picks up that same conversation when he looks at Philemon and said, you might not have counted the cost of what it meant to become a Christian, what it meant to become the head of a house church, what it meant to say that I am my brother's keeper and my brother is anyone who finds themselves in need of my love. You might not have counted that cost, but the cost has come to be paid. And are you ready to do that? And I have to imagine that if we were able, as more than rhetorical exercise, to get Jesus and Paul here, they would look on us and say to us, what do you think it means to name yourself a Christian? What did it mean to you? We, uh, we were asking this question at the first service, and then we sang this song, and the song was all the, uh, I'm going to try not to let all my biases show, kind of happy, clappy, Jesus is wonderful and great, and my life is phenomenal because Jesus is in it. And I'm always a little skeptical of that voice because I find my, my Jesus being in my life is a pain in my neck, Right? Because there are so many times that I'm looking out, and don't you do this way? Maybe it's I'm going to balance the checkbook. Maybe it's I'm deciding if I want to go to Comic-Con in Seattle. Maybe it's I want to figure out that if I'm going to do that, what am I going to save money on? And I, and, I'm, and I go and I see a really easy way to get what I want that seems to be in my self-interest, and then I'm like, 
well, Jesus, could you just turn around for a minute? Because it's going to be really easy if I don't think you're looking. Right? Hey, Paul, could you not pay attention for a minute and write me no letters? Because it would just be so easy if I didn't have this strong claim on my life to keep working towards a world in which there aren't haves and have-nots, in which love pr triumphs, in which justice is palpable. If I didn't feel this sense of this drive, I had to tell my wife this week, actually I sat in a meeting because I joined two new nonprofit boards in the last two weeks, and, and the second one I said, does any of you here want to tell my wife? Um, and so I, I did tell her, I told her with the kids in the car, so she couldn't yell at me too much. And I'm like, but here's the problem. In my life, I have this drive that says, keep counting the cost of what it means to live in a social order that wants to benefit me, in which I have to keep working to make sure that it benefits everybody. To keep working towards a world in which love and justice are our primary values. And that has a cost, and we pay that cost daily. And we bear the one who paid the ultimate cost. So Paul says, Rome may put me in prison, but I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I'm a prisoner of God's love. And may everyone be able to see the truth of that in everything I do. Have you counted the cost? This is the word of our Lord.